welcome to season five of the LuxCast, where we explore the intersections of Christian faith, culture, and our lives. My name is Megan Rice, Communications Coordinator at Western Theological Seminary. The theme of this season is public theology, as we engage in dialogue about topics that affect both the church and society. Today's guest is Dr. Greg Lee, Associate Professor of Theology and Urban Studies at Wheaton College. Dr. Lee was on campus giving a lecture on an Augustinian theology of mass incarceration. Much of Dr. Lee's work appropriates Augustine as a resource for addressing contemporary issues of church and society. A resident of the Lawndale neighborhood of Chicago, he is especially interested in urban questions of race and class, which he approaches from a distinctly Asian American perspective. WTS student and Wheaton grad Anna Erickson sat down with him to discuss mass incarceration. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Lee. I'm excited for our conversation. Just so listeners can get to know you, can you explain your experiences with studying Augustine and living in your neighborhood and how those things began to intersect in the ways you think about theology? Yeah, so I um, first got interested in Augustine during graduate school when I um, was writing my dissertation on Calvin and Augustine. I was at a Methodist school at Duke and I wanted to um, go more deeply in my own roots, which are more Reformed and Presbyterian. And I was just sort of pairing those, um, those figures off of each other. What I found was that Calvin felt so familiar to me that he felt very comfortable, he felt very safe, but he wasn't sort of stimulating me in the same way. Whereas Augustine was similar and different enough that I felt myself um, gravitating toward him, toward him more than I did, Cal than I did toward Calvin. Um, as I kept studying these figures, um, I got really into Augustine's political theology in City of God and understanding the way that he thinks about the relationship between the church and the world and how Christians are supposed to operate in the world. And then it was after my PhD, when I was starting my position at Wheaton, that I ended up um, moving into the inner city of Chicago where I was confronted with issues of race, class, justice that I'd never witnessed before. And I found Augustine a really helpful um, figure to help me think through the kinds of things that I was being confronted with. Mm -hmm. And so getting into Augustine's political thought helped me to think about the political issues I was facing in front of me in a low-income black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So in your lecture last night, you articulated that Augustine helps us to see mass incarceration as ultimately derivative of a collective spiritual problem. Mm -hmm. And he uses the lens of Roman pagan religions to communicate that. So could you expand on what the spiritual problem collectively is behind mass incarceration um, and ways that you see the church today succumbing to the lust and idolatry of the Roman religion that Augustine was talking about? Yeah, so Augustine's City of God is this giant work of about a thousand pages, but it has a really simple argument, which is that humanity divides between those who love God above self and those who love self above God. And so you sort of see these two communities run throughout history, the heavenly city and the earthly city, um, and they're characterized um, by very different kinds of social manifestations of their spiritual decision to love God over self or self over God. And that ties to Augustine with a love of earthly goods over heavenly goods versus a love for heavenly goods over earthly goods. And he sees in um, Roman religion and in all of Roman society this problem of overly prioritizing earthly goods and trying to get temporal things at all costs, which he sees manifest in Rome's history of war and violence and also in their history of idolatry, both of which are efforts to get earthly goods. So it's not an orientation toward the heavenly, not an orientation toward the eternal, it's an orientation toward earthly things. And mass incarceration, I understand, at least in part, as a function of um, the fragmentation of our society um, according to race and class lines. And all, quite a lot of that has to do with concerns about safety, um, decisions about what kinds of neighborhoods that you want to live in, where you want to send your kids to school, and so forth. And it ends up becoming um, a very vicious dynamic where when you have um, populations of different races and classes so sharply segregated according to those lines, um, and all the power of the criminal justice system is only in one community, it becomes very easy for that community to mistreat the other, the one that has less power. And so for me, living in um, a low-income black neighborhood and then working in a context like Wheaton, which is suburban and predominantly white, 
Um, I see how these communities are um, living in many ways in very different realities and the concerns that, they're, um, uh, th that they face on a day-to-day -day basis are very, very different. At the same time, I see how the difference between these communities isn't just about one individual um, who's making a decision about how to live their life. It's about sort of collective dynamics um, that we all play into in a certain way. And that seems to me very related to the kinds of things that Augustine says about Roman religion, mm -hmm. where there's a kind of collective orientation toward earthly goods that results in this system that's much bigger than any individual. Mm -hmm. Mass incarceration, I think, is related to a kind of collective segregation of our society according to race and class lines, mm -hmm. and it results in these kinds of um, injustices, like the number of people that we incarcerate and how um, demographically uh, uh, it, there's such a racial bias in the system. Mm -hmm. Can you speak about how your experiences in your neighborhood and your church have changed the way that you think about mass incarceration? Yeah, so before coming to my neighborhood, I don't know if I ever knew anybody who was incarcerated, mm -hmm. but I am now um, at church and in Bible study and so forth with quite a number of uh, men especially who have been formerly incarcerated, some women as well, but especially men. And the main effect it's had on me is just to sort of humanize them, mm -hmm. to sort of see that they are, that, that the population of the incarcerated is not just sort of these remorseless thugs or criminals out mm -hmm. there, but they're actually human beings, that they in many cases grew up in extremely difficult circumstances, mm -hmm. and that some of the life decisions that they made um, that landed them in prison actually make a lot of sense coming out of that context. Mm -hmm. And there's very much this feeling where if I had grown up in similar circumstances, I could have seen that being my fate as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I'm in close community with men who have served, you know, 33 years, you know, for having committed murder or 10 years in a max, you know, security prison or something like this, mm -hmm. and they have become some of my spiritual heroes because they have gone through so much, because they have suffered so much, they've been at the, at, at the very bottom, they've hit rock mm -hmm. bottom, and they somehow discovered hope in the midst of that and are now trying to share the gospel with everybody that they can find because mm -hmm. they discovered this hope in Christ in prison that, um, that turned their life around. Mm -hmm. there's, there's something about the power of the Holy Spirit in that context um, that's deeply humbling and that mm -hmm. helps me think about um, the humanity of those that we put in prison in a very, very different kind of way. Mm -hmm. And it, become, it, it just makes you feel like there's something really wrong about the fact that we are putting these people in cages. Like, that, mm -hmm. that these aren't people who are you know, just a threat to society. These aren't people who are um, only you know, characterized by destruction or their worst mistakes. Mm -hmm. They're human beings who are in very difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so what then is the obligation of Christians towards serving that community? Mm -hmm. what does your work surrounding Augustine and mass incarceration and your own experiences mean practically for pastors? So in other words, if I'm a future pastor, what advice or challenge or encouragement would you give to me as I seek to be faithful in, in that particular calling? Yeah, so I think what is really interesting about the presently incarcerated is that um, any kind of contact between those who are in prison and those who are in the outside world, in a sense, has to be initiated by those in the outside world. Because those who are in prison, by definition, are immobile. Like, they can't come to you. That's what it means to be in prison. They're stuck there. Um, and I'm a big believer at, in proximity. I think that when you are in direct, embodied, face-to-face -face relationship with people, it changes um, the kinds of issues that you care about, you develop empathy, you start to enter into solidarity with them and take their concerns to be your concerns as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you're talking about incarceration, there is only that much more um, of a kind of responsibility on those who do have freedom of movement to take the initiative in that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that everybody is called to you know, prison ministry per se or to work in this kind of area, but I think as a general principle, um, I think the health of a spiritual community can be measured to some extent by how it treats its most vulnerable and forgotten members. Mm. That we constantly have to be aware of who's in the room, who's being neglected, who's not in the room, mm -hmm. and um, to attend to them with special, special priority because, um, they're, because they're not getting priority from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And 
when we do that, I think the church um, starts to exhibit a kind of, you know, bottom up um, culture where we put the first last and the last first, where there's a kind of equalizing effect where those who are typically forgotten end up exercising a very special place within our communities. Mm. And I think that um, prison ministry, working with the incarcerated, working with at-risk youth and so forth is just one manifestation of that, mm -hmm. but you can see that in a variety of different ways, mm -hmm. whether it be with the elderly, the infirm, um, with those who are homeless, with, mm -hmm. yeah, a variety of other contexts. My last question has to do with your studying more patristic and pre-modern sources and theologians. Um, I think you're drawing from Augustine to speak to the realities of mass incarceration highlights the enduring value of mm -hmm. early Christian theology in our present moment as the church in the world. Um, so more broadly, what perspectives, insights from patristic and pre-modern theologians are especially relevant for today's cultural moment? Yeah, so what I really like about the early church is that there's a sense um, in which it's familiar because so much of our faith is shaped by it, but it's, it's also very, very different because it's such a different um, historical and, and, and social and geographical context from what we're used to. And so I like to go deep into the early church um, as a kind of cultural immersion. It's almost like going to a different country where you mm -hmm. see you know, folks in different places don't eat at the same times, or they don't eat the same foods, or they interact with each other differently on the subway platform or something mm -hmm. like this. And interacting with a different culture helps you to see your own culture through, uh, through new eyes. And so when you go deep into the early church, it seems like you have fresh perspective to think about some of the issues that divide us today. Mm -hmm. So one example in that regard would be um, the division that you often get between conservative and liberal Christians, mm -hmm. um, however you define that, between those who are um, really committed to good doctrine or individual conversion or something like this on the individual and the personal, versus those who are more interested in issues of social justice and helping out the poor and things like that. And I just don't think you see that divide in the early church. Mm. Um, when I think about somebody like Basil of Caesarea or the mm. Cappadocian Fathers, who are these very important theologians from Turkey in the fourth century, they are very, very theological. Mm -hmm. They're deeply immersed in their Bibles and they are engaging with profound theological issues. In many ways, they are responsible for the way that we articulate the doctrine of the Trinity today. Mm -hmm. But they're also really involved with relief efforts for those who are suffering after a famine. Um, Basel is frequently um, considered to be the founder of the modern day hospital. Mm -hmm. So that um, back then doctors would have done home visits, but he created this place where the infirm would all be sort of in the same place and doctors could serve them in the, in the same location. He's mm -hmm. um, frequently considered with sort of, uh, sort of considered the founder um, of the hospital. He, essentially created like community centers mm -hmm. where um, people who didn't have places to stay could you know, stay overnight and be afforded hospitality and so forth. And again, he's extraordinarily responsible for our, the way that we articulate the doctrine of the Trinity today. Mm -hmm. So there's a blend there between um, justice, caring about the poor, social services and so forth, and with deep theology and an mm -hmm. emphasis on conversion and faith in Christ and so forth. Um, in the early church, you don't see the same kind of divide, for instance, mm -hmm. between church and academy, mm -hmm. right? You don't see a difference between what happens, you know, with pastors and what happens with professors. They, the people who are writing the most theological texts are preaching every Sunday and are involved with the day-to-day -day life of their congregation. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways in which I think the early church um, integrates things that I think need to go together for healthy Christianity um, that we bifurcate. And mm -hmm. to look at the early church for models like that, I think would be very mm -hmm. helpful for bridging some of our social divides. Mm -hmm. That's a good word. Thanks so much, Dr. Lee. Thanks, Anna.